Thank you, everyone. So, yeah, as Kylie mentioned, I'm uh, Chief Architect, do Sport and Knowledge. So I, I cover quite a broad um, piece of our, our online offering. And I guess in the data space, it gives me a couple of perspectives. I've got the kind of broad perspective that kind of understands what the vision of the organisation is. And then I get the rather uncomfortable job of trying to turn that vision into something a little bit more tangible. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that today. And I think some of the references we heard earlier about um, government somewhat apply to what we do here in t at the BBC in terms of there's a, there's, a, there's a big vision and a determination to have big business cases that set out how we're going to achieve that vision and I don't think that always works in the data world. Um, so as I say we've got a desire to do big things with big data, lots of people talk, are starting to talk about a concept called My BBC um, and it gets talked about in lots of different ways. Um, but probably the best summary is one of the questions that our new Director General asked when he first joined, which was, how can we get closer to our audiences and what are the ways of doing that? And for what is traditionally a fairly broadcast organisation, that question is much more relevant in the, the interactive and online space. And there's some questions about how we might bring that back into the broadcast space. But really, I think the, the major piece of thinking is about um, the online space. So... We can get a little bit more detail behind that, and we talk about um, a few different segments. So there's a bit around how, do we, how are we more engaging um, as a proposition, and there's lots of discussions about whether interactive meetings, uh, mediums are more engaging than broadcast mediums. So Twitter is the obvious second screen conversation that quite often happens, uh, and there's a feeling that, that something about the attractiveness of that is that kind of engaging two-way experience. And that kind of leads you as well into more social um, experiences and it feels from our perspective that when we talk to the people who look after what we call products in the BBC um, th they're still grasping what social really means for their product and that there's a, a little bit of a fear of um, exposing data through some of those social channels in that it might lose eyeballs to there versus the fact that it clearly adds to reach and then sat in the middle is that some form of personalization so everyone feels that there's a benefit there and that that's the sort of thing that people want. I think it's probably best articulated by one of our graduates who kind of said, I really just want the BBC page that shows me all the stuff I'm interested in. Um, but we've also found that our previous attempts at doing that have been fairly clunky and not worked so well. So we tend to offer people checkboxes to pick things. And that's a kind of fairly explicit way of asking you what you're interested in. And the feedback we tend to get is it doesn't really get much take up. And when you look at some of the other personalised experiences on the web and you think around Amazon recommendations and some of the things LinkedIn are doing, they tend to be more implicit based. Um, and so all of that says really underneath you need some fundamental capability before you can go ahead and do all these interesting experiences. So we have that kind of very high level view, but when you look at that middle view and say, well, what can I translate that into? There's a set of building blocks that my, my developers can go and do stuff with and, and so on then we find that we have a few more problems because we're trying to take what's a fairly high-level concept and map it to people who really like very um, specific uh, requests. So we're also challenged by our operating model. So there was a process called Putting Quality First a few years ago that kind of attempted to put some bounds on the things that we do online. And one of the outputs of that was a product model. So we think in a world of 10 products up there, um, and that effectively means that we're organised in a set of verticals. So there's a bunch of people who think about sport and a bunch of people who think about news. And there's a few horizontals that join those up, but they tend to be, uh, in my technical vocabulary, I would call lower layers of the stack. So how do we share some infrastructure? And what, when we start thinking about some of these data experiences, what we actually find is they're about sewing together things that sit within those silos. And that's not always an easy thing to do in a world that's organised in this kind of very vertical model. Um, and, of course, like a lot of organisations, we've got a very complex brownfield landscape. So one of the pieces of analysis that went on last year tried to identify a lot of the islands of data we have. We tended to group them into the kind of public service stuff in the UK and the stuff that BBC Worldwide have. And there's some barriers between those, some of that for very good reason. There's some certainly policy reasons why we can't share some of that data. But the real um, usefulness of that picture, I think, is it shows you what I guess a lot of organisations face, which is a lot of islands. And actually, if you start to sew those islands together, that's where the, the perception is that there's some value. Um, so having had a number of analysis phases, we started to talk about some of the things that we could do. And we started to 
put together some core logical concepts, and I can't really claim credit for this. I think a lot of it came out of um, some material we heard when Werner Vogels came uh, to speak to us and some other people on the web have talked in this, this fashion. But it certainly helped us with our business stakeholders talk to them in a language that they understand. Um, and one of my colleagues had a very nice term for the store part, and he talked about what we'd call a data midden. So, you know, if you refer back to an archaeological concept, a, a big bin of waste of stuff that seems unimportant at the time, but his, when you go back and look at it, you actually find a bunch of value there that no one really realised at the time. And we kind of, we saw that that store was quite an important thing. And traditionally, people often think of that sort of store as being a data warehouse. But we felt in our scenario that attempted to impose too much requirements early on. So a much more unstructured, NoSQL type data store felt more valuable because we couldn't sensibly decide how to order that data in a lot of cases. But we did feel that at later points in the journey, we would come back to that data and start to pull it apart. Um, so having done that, we figured we would, we would concentrate on the left-hand side, really, that collect, store, and begin to organize because until you can do that part, the right-hand side is a harder bit to do, although clearly everyone loves the visualization piece and the, the graphs and so on that can come out of it. Um, so we decided to pick a use case where we could avoid some of the ambiguity that fits in some of the other areas. So we picked a thing called real user monitoring. So we had a business problem, which was we're moving towards a thing called responsive design, which means we do more on the client device than we have historically. And that meant it was harder for us to monitor the performance of it, given our current mechanisms. And also, we struggled to know when people were getting a bad user experience. So there's a kind of business need to collect a bunch of this data. And when we applied what the well-known 3Vs model, volume, velocity, and variety, to the problem, we found it, it kind of ticked two of those. We've got quite high volume. So if you take every uh, page request we get per day, it's a fair amount of data. And there's quite a velocity there as well. So we see quite significant spikes in the data. It, it was a very clearly defined use case, so the ambiguity on the edges wasn't... Um, we'd kind of mitigated a bunch of that, so we knew what we had to deliver. And it allowed us to prove some technology and something that was important and that people had a real interest in, but it wasn't business critical. So if this uh, collection and storage of data disappeared for a day, people would be a bit annoyed, but they could live with it. If we took our web analytics data down for a day and we couldn't give number of page views uh, in a day to the business, they'd be quite angry about that. So we, um, we went on a bit of journey building that. We, it took us a little while to get that embedded in one of our products. So everyone had an interest in performance. They really wanted to see these graphs. When it came to them doing some work, we found that a bit of a harder challenge. We um, eventually turned that on a couple of weeks ago with responsive news. So we get quite a few data points. The day we turned it on it just happened to be the day Mrs. Thatcher died. So we saw more of a spike than we'd anticipated. But it was a good proof of our initial data pipeline and that architecture. And we pulled out some initial findings that are up there. And they, I guess they showed one of the other characteristics we see of data, which is a, it's a fairly addictive thing. Whenever you give some of these data points out to the business, what you get is a whole bunch of questions back. So when you tell them there's a mean time of three seconds or that we think Nigeria is the fastest um, rendering country outside the UK, you get flooded with a bunch of questions. Well, why is that? What tells you that? What do you think is causing that behavior? How can we make it go faster? And I think we see that in various other areas as well. Um, so the visualization piece I mentioned is still a little bit basic. There's lots of columns of data. We've got some graphs now that start to show us some of the spikes. And a bit like others in this area, we can, um, we can start to show when we think there's a server-side problem or when there's a client-side problem. Um, but the real value to us has been that it started to prove that pipeline. So concurrent with this, there was a, a piece running that said, well, what do we do with our web analytics? It's kind of there. It decayed a little bit. People felt that there's another bunch of really useful data. If we can start to combine it with some of our other data, it will start informing some of those earlier ambitions. Um, so having proved a piece with the real user monitoring piece, I got given the problem of the data analytics piece. So we've now got about five people who pretty much are the only people that really start to think about stitching this together with some of the more open source technologies working together. And we can now start to link some of that performance information with some of the behavioral information. Um, so just a little bit about the technology. Um, slightly uh, with a reference back to the earlier point, we're also doing a proof of concept with a third party about how we could open up some of the data that, that we currently have. Um, 
this gave us a nice opportunity to also uh, test the scalability of that solution. So we pump all the data through, um, in this case, it's Mashery's API, and that also gives us a nice um, high-level analytics uh, view. So it gives us an easy way of visualizing how much data is coming through at any point in time. On the back end of that, we've got a small Node.js implementation that takes the initial hit. Um, we route it through to a thing called FluentD, which passes it out to Storm. We also go and store it in CouchDB, and we're starting now to hook it into some of the other back ends we've got. So our Common School data analytics piece, we've got some uh, Elastic Map Reduce running, and some pieces of supporting data inside the BBC we're starting to plug in. So, for example, we've got a thing called BBC ID. Not very many people know about it or use it, where people can sign in. There's ambitions to do things with that. At the moment, we're just trying to see what we can get out of actually um, the small data set that we've got. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of those uh, choices. So quite a lot of our online offering is hosted within our own data centers. We decided to put this on AWS. Obvious um, points around scalability and agility there. Um, and really, I think one of the reasons we we chose AWS is some of those features like Elastic Map Produce really simplify the amount of work that we have to do. And with a, what's a fairly small team looking at the problem, that works quite well for us. We pick Couch. Um, we use it elsewhere, and it's got a nice iterative Map Produce function that we felt was a, a good start. Um, FluentD was a really nice piece of technology for allowing us to plug different data sources in and route them to different places. It had some nice use cases where it's been proven and some pre-canned connectors. Um, a node we've been really pleased with. We kind of knew a lot about it conceptually. We found it's uh, taken the throughput that we're throwing at it really well. So we run it off of a small AWS instance. It copes with the load really, really well. Uh, and it's found, we found some nice integration points into our front-end JavaScript clients as well. Um, so then we've started to think about what comes next. So one of the areas people are really interested in are recommendations as being a kind of fairly foundational piece. Um, We've got a little bit of technology around this. Some of the really interesting stuff is coming out of our R&D department. So the screenshot here is one of their visualization pieces about try, trying to find ways of showing people popularity of programs in a, in a different fashion. So our initial engagement with them has been to be able to pipe them a data set in a much more easy-to-consume fashion than they previously had access to. So before, they've had to go and grab logs from various places. Now we can just turn on a pipeline of data that they can use. Um, the URL at the bottom points to a blog post of theirs. It's quite interesting. It talks about a bunch of the different visualizations they have. So if visualization is a thing that um, you have an interest in, it, it's worth a read. We're also thinking about um, a platform we're building called Open Games. Um, and on one level, we've got quite a, a niche for Open Games, which is we do uh, children's and CBBS, and there's a bunch of games on there heavily flash orientated, slowly moving towards HTML5. Um, but we're currently doing some work on some of our other propositions about whether we can sew some of this content together to make more interactive propositions. So the thing that um, I'm showing up there is a, a kind of prototype we've been doing about flooding. So the idea is to tie some of our concepts together. That say we've got some footage, um, predominantly news footage, and we've got some narrative footage that starts to teach people, well, why do we see increased flooding? What are the sort of things that um, you might do to protect against that flooding? And then ultimately there's a, a game, a kind of SimCity Lite type game where you can pick different types of flood defense within a budget and apply those and then you get to see some visuals of that flooding taken from our archive footage. And the data piece is really useful in various ways. So one thing is it helps us understand how effective our narrative is. So if we tell you within the narrative that walls are the most um, effective prevention of flooding, to take a fairly simplistic example, we can then track through whether users are are understanding that, and particularly in the educational area, are we seeing a high proportion of walls being bought or are people not picking up elements of that narrative? And as we start to um, lay different assets into that narrative that aren't just textual, we can understand that efficiency. And then there's a piece that's, uh, that's more broad about, well, how do we personalise that experience to you? It could be as simple as instead of talking about Wales, for me, we talk about London. For my mother-in-law, we talk about Glasgow. Um, or perhaps there's, there's other aspects as we start to layer on more complex models around um, either your age or demographic and so on that we, we could look at there. Um, so to enable all of that, we're looking at some um, other technologies. So we're looking at putting Mongo into place. 
we think Mongo um, gives us a bit more of a built-in analytics capability, so you can do more with that data than you can with Couch, and has a bit of a better dynamic querying provision. And I spoke earlier about the kind of data middle where we just throw everything and we may come back to it. And we see in our model a kind of seven-day store, which we use more actively, and then it gets thrown into the middle. And it may be that we insert Mongo as the seven-day store and keep Couch as the other store, or we may just do a, a straight swap out. Um, Scala's gradually gaining traction at the BBC, so it's one of those things that we're looking at. We, it feels more productive to us than Java, and there's a really nice um, technology called Spark that is a kind of equivalent to Hadoop that you can plug into with Scala. We think it has a lot of potential. We haven't really started using it yet, so I can't swear by it, but it's something we're really investigating. Um, I also wanted to touch on the privacy question. I think this is really interesting. So we... I think the people that are technologists amongst us really understand that there's some kind of implicit com contract with Google and Apple and those kind of organizations where we're siphoning them a bunch of data and they're doing things with it. I think there's a whole proportion of users of smartphones that don't really understand the implications and the amount of data that they're effectively giving away. We feel there's value in collecting some data from the public in helping kind of personalize that experience. And a non-BBC um, lady I was talking to a couple of weeks ago, I thought, put it really well. So she said that she, she gets very personalised emails from a very big grocery retailer that targets stuff. And she said a couple of years ago she would have thought that was really creepy, but now she just kind of expects it. And so from one aspect, we're getting for this, well, people just expect the personalised BBC. That's the thing that they really want. On the other aspect, I think we think there's quite a strong role that we could play in kind of informing people a little bit about the pros and cons of some of these things. And like everything, it's a trade-off. And I think some people would be quite happy to give their data, even understanding the implications of that. Other people would be a bit more reserved. And the cookie legislation last year was a good example of something where you start to see that people are trying to bring those trade-offs out um, and expose them to people. And maybe it hasn't quite worked yet, so I think a lot of people probably see that. Do you accept cookies banner? get rid of it and carry on doing what they're doing. But it feels that there's a coming conversation around privacy and what are those trade-offs and are people happy to make them. Um, and I think periodically in our debate around what we do with data, there is that thinking. Um, and some of the answer to that will be, I suspect, that we will try and open up sets of data for people to understand what's there. And some of that answer will be about being more explicit about what you're agreeing to by doing certain things with our experience. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the group of people doing this. So um, we started very small. It's not a very big team, We're clearly a very big organization. But in this area, I think it's a very nascent team. And that's been really good for us. It means that um, we can really focus on delivering value to the business. And it kind of feels like we have to justify everything we do by delivering things to people that they really get some benefit out of. And in an area that can be quite abstract, that really helps focus the things that you're doing. And also a fairly small team size like that helps us iterate um, fairly quickly. In a big organization, when you're trying to manage a lot of stakeholders, it's sometimes quite nice to have a small team that can just be getting on with things. Um, and a couple of learnings that we've taken. I, I think some of our developers really expect perfect definition from the business, and I think that's the kind of thing technology people talk about a lot. We rarely get it, and in this area, we, we really won't get that definition. People are learning learning. I think they learn best when they see that data and it, it really is an iterative experience that you get a bit of data, it drives a set more questions and then that sets you a set of uh, a set directions. There's also a piece around reducing the problem. It can become the biggest all-encompassing thing that you ever wish to do and periodically we have people who talk to us about saying off massive programs of work where we're going to define huge sets of requirements and that's just the wrong place to be at this moment in time. We can't specify clearly enough what we want to do that, and we need to do some initial work to understand that. So it may be later on that we say we really need to invest in a predictive analytics engine or a data warehouse or something else, but we're not at that point yet. Um, the beginning with important but non-critical data we found really useful. It meant that we kind of stood this technology up and got some feedback on how well it was working. So I think had we turned on more crucial data through a Node.js implementation on AWS, we probably would have got a lot of scared people. Um, and low friction mechanisms to kind of gather that data was really important as well. So a lot of the people that are our data sources, they kind of get it, but they've got 
five, ten other big priorities on at the time. So finding space in those roadmaps is really, really hard. We found that that going out, really engaging with them, making it as simple as possible for them, giving them the bit of code we need them to put in place, the test frameworks, sitting with them for a week to get that integrated has really made that work. And it, it, it may well be a focus of that piece I showed earlier around the horizontal and verticals that we're trying to sew some of those things together. But we found some simple stuff there has, has really helped us. And some of that is we have to go and make the developer go and speak to someone, but it does kind of move us forward. Um, and so that was really it. It um, be really great to get some feedback. I'm happy to take a few questions and kind of offline, either if people wish to... Uh, tell us stuff about some of the areas we're going in or ask us questions about what we're doing. Really keen to share. There'll be some stuff in the next month or so appearing on our internet blog and that will also allow for comments. So is one um, feedback mechanism. I'm happy to take emails, all those other interaction mechanisms. And James, who uh, wouldn't quite give me a photo for this, he was the kind of brains behind a lot of the technical detail. And again, he's more than happy to answer queries, take feedback. He's been to a number of events like this. He couldn't make it today because one of the big things for us is getting an understanding of what's going on in that landscape. And if we can play a part in that, we'd love to. Um, and so that's my point. I'd just like to say thanks, everyone, for listening and uh, happy for questions. Thanks very much. <laughs> so this is a great time for questions. Do we have anyone? Ivan. Hi, Ivan Herman from W3C. Um, I know that uh, BBC, other areas in BBC have a great job in reusing external data sets and incorporating it into the website, you know, DBpedia and Wizard Brains and other things. How does that come into your analytics framework, or is it completely disjoint? So we're starting to... We're starting to sew some of these things together. So I've got colleagues uh, who I think were at an event earlier this week, uh, the 3C we're doing, talking about some of the things we're trying to do um, with RDF in particular. It's, it's about saying that. So we're, I think I would say we've got the foundational capabilities. So we've started to tag a bunch of content with concepts. We're starting to get an understanding of what people are using on the site. The interesting thing now is how do we sew those concepts together? So I think that's our challenge over the next six months. I think we've got some thinking around how we do that, but it, it's about how we validate it. So everyone is in the mix, and uh, one of the, the interesting bits we're having is communicating back to the organization how all these threads play together. So on one hand, they hear about opening up data through APIs. They hear RDFA on another hand. Well, should I pick one or the other? Are they both complementary? And I think we're trying to put in place enough of a narrative that says we need to explore some of these areas further. Uh, and I guess it goes back to that earlier point, which is everyone wants the business case for the answer when actually the answer is to explore a little more first. We have time for an, one more question, if anyone has. Way up there, Stuart. Wave your hand still so you can see. Nope, down a bit. Could you put your hand up, sir? Thank you. Yes. Hello, um, Charlie from, uh, from Rackspace, but don't worry, I don't work in sales, okay. so uh, I won't come in on AWS. The, um, the, my question really, at the, at the beginning of, the, uh, of, of, of your talk, you, you mentioned about um, social and Twitter uh, playing a, being a, potentially a, a new area where there will be a large uh, influx of data and potentially you know, interesting data, which... which uh, do you have a plan for being able to use that kind of social data, and is that something which you're you're working on integrating into a into the data warehouse? So we're looking at it. Do we have plans? So there's different aspects within the organisation. That there's the people that work on the kind of news gathering side that see it as a a source of information that tells them about things that are going on in the world. So there's a bunch of analytics that's happening there, and we would like to understand that a bit better, but maybe it's not as directly important in our stage at the moment. There's a bunch of stuff that people then talk about around our programs. People are starting to look at that, and there's people in the organization who really see what kind of Hulu and Netflix and the like are doing. The, the question is, we're kind of in that space between, we're a broadcast organization, if I'm a creative producer, I know the thing that you want to watch, right? I innately know it, versus that there's a bunch of data out there that might inform you a bit better. So we're, 
and some of that, I think, will come out of some of the organisational questions that um, the Director General will look at about how you balance some of these things together. There is a... But we're trying to turn on some of those data feeds to understand the difference between what the behaviour is we see on the site, and for example in iPlayer, versus what people are saying in Twitter. So at some levels there's a perception that the fire hose isn't as useful um, as we may think. On another level there's a perception that people say a different thing necessarily to what they do on the behaviour. So I think we think it's, it's an interesting data set, um, but we're we're still exploring how we use it. And we did some stuff for the Olympics on Facebook, so we made some of our Olympics uh, coverage available on Facebook. We streamed it, and it wasn't massively successful, which kind of sends some messages inside the organisation. My personal view was, I suspect for a lot of that sporting um, type of AV content, you probably normally watch that through your TV. If you've spent a grand on a big screen TV, that's where you're going to watch it. So some of the other areas are more niche for that. Um, so... Things like that have kind of set the social question in certain directions, so it will come back, but I think it's, it's about, again, applying that focus on what we're trying to use it for.